Hi, thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And each week we normally take questions and, uh, and uh, explore our history together. And this week we're going to change gears a little bit and, uh, and do something a little different than we normally do. And we're going to explore a specific topic in our collective histories. Um, this week, uh, straddling a, an, an anniversary, if you will, uh, at the uh, marking the end of the Second World War, we're going to be focusing entirely on uh, the, the history of the Second World War and its connections to historic Mississauga. Uh, we're going to have a couple of guests on with us this week to explore different aspects of it. We have a couple of questions we've taken, some facts, some did you knows, um, and uh, we're going to uh, to wander down memory lane, if you will, um, and look at the stories of the Second World War. Well, and ask, ask a historian this week, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Greg Carraro back to our, our program here. Greg is the Vice President of Heritage Mississauga, but he's also a uh, high school teacher with the uh, Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. Uh, and uh, 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 for many of you who know Greg, uh, a, a true history buff, a historian in his own right, um, and a, a wonderful history teacher who really does bring history to life. And uh, I've invited uh, uh, Greg on to our program today to uh, talk about the the, uh, the teaching of um, and uh, our connecting to uh, as as residents within the modern city, within as Canadian citizens today, connecting to the theme of the Second World War, um, and and what it is that it can teach us, and 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 uh, and, and how we learn from these moments in time. So, uh, Greg, thank you for joining us, and uh, and uh, really look forward to kind of sharing your insights. Uh, I, I mean, you live and breathe history in the classroom. I've I've, I've seen you, uh, and uh, uh, you really do bring history to life, uh, just through your own passion for it but your, your commitment to engagement, and uh, I applaud you for that, and uh, um, uh, I, I look forward to kind of sharing your insights on the, on the Second World War. Thank you for having me on again, Matthew. So what is it that, uh, this, uh, how do you approach the Second World War in uh, a, a teaching perspective? Uh, what, what, what kind of, what, what inroads do you take to, to introduce the subject? Uh, well, I, I generally, uh, you know, part of the course is taught chronologically and the other half, the other part is, is thematic. And it's sort of a, 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 culmin a culmination of uh, the events that occurred during the interwar periods. So at the end of World War I and then the 20s and 30s and how the events, both social and economic in those interwar periods led to the Second World War. And particularly, of course, from a Canadian perspective. So, um, some of the themes during the interwar period that we look at is immigration, for instance, and how that impacts on the mindset of Canadians. You know, the, the difference between the First World War and the, the larger population of Anglo-Canadians and their loyalty to the Crown versus the period leading up to the Second World War and a much greater um, influx of uh, Europeans and others from other parts of the world does change the tone. I mean, the patriotic fervor is still there, but it's not anywhere near as it was, close as it was in the first uh, war. So that's one thing that we look at. Also Canada's growing uh, autonomy, uh, the Statute of Westminster, which is, uh, if you're familiar with it, the, uh, the document that was signed with, uh, with Westminster in England in 1931, which basically gave Canada an opportunity to make its own decisions on international affairs, which wasn't the case in the First World War. In fact, um, United Kingdom and France declared war on Germany, I believe it was September 3rd, Whereas Canada waited in, uh, full until September 10th to declare war on Germany. Not, whether or not that was symbolic or not, it certainly would not have been possible prior to uh, 1931. So these are some of the, the things that we're looking at uh, leading up to the war and introducing the war. How, how do you uh, approach uh, uh, the topic of the political picture, I guess, for lack of a better word. I mean, we haven't really touched on the, the greater picture of uh, the rise of Nazi Germany and, and, and Hitler within our discussions in, in, uh, in this topic. And really, we tend to look at it more from a local perspective of, of those that went and served and fell. But uh, you have, uh, you alluded to kind of that uh, the first, the fervor of the First World War that was that, that rush of uh, 
patriotism of uh, defending Mother Britain and uh, uh, the war, uh, you know, Canadians were, were British uh, in that sense. Um, how, how do you, uh, how does the, the, the broader picture of the political news make its way into what you teach today? Uh, you mean comparing it to, to, to today or how oh, no, I... No, no, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Maybe misspoke that. I, I just... Do well, because you... I do that as well. Okay. Oh, you do. Fair enough. Uh, but introducing the subjects of Nazism, uh, if that's the right term, I'm not sure. Of the Nazi uh, Fascism. I, I generally Nazism, approach it. Yeah. Fascism. Um, well, again, before I begin the Second World War, and in that interwar period, particularly in the 1930s, um, I, I look at uh, extremism in Canada. I look at the uh, anti-Semitism in places like in Quebec, uh, you know, uh, government uh, policy discriminating against Jews, for instance, and, uh, and immigrants from Eastern Europe. And the same is, I, I also look at the uh, Christie Pitts riots in Toronto, which occurred uh, prior to the start of the Second World War, which pitted um, Toronto's immigrant population, predominantly uh, the Jews, but also the Italians, against the Anglo population of Toronto, who had culminated in a riot by Christy Pitts after a baseball game in which a, uh, a Nazi banner was unfurled uh, and uh, led to a, a day-long uh, running riot throughout that part of the city. So um, it's, and, and I also have to add, and I do remind the students that this Second World War and, you know, the, the Chamberlain's kind of um, peace in our time comment, we look at that and my students laugh and go, what a dummy, didn't they know? But he wasn't alone in his um, beliefs that Germany was just trying to recoup its losses and, oh, they were treated too harshly after the First World War. And besides, none of us really like immigrants. We're all xenophobic. And um, I mean, there was a, a very healthy dose of xenophobia in Canada at the time. Um, and, you know, there's no coincidence that um, Hitler was also t uh, Time Life's Man of the Year in 1936 or 37 following the Munich Olympics. And so there was, um, I don't know if sympathy is the right word, but at the very least a, a certain amount of apathy regarding extremism elsewhere in the world because we had our fair share here. And of course we know that even once the war begins, we know that, um, my apologies, um, <laughs> we, we even know that uh, during the war, the internment of Japanese Canadians and to a lesser degree, Italian Canadians demonstrates definitely uh, some form of uh, prejudice, if not outright racism. So um, again, that's one way in which the political and the social is kind of woven in. I don't know if that was... Oh, yeah. I, I do. Thank you for that, because I, I often think we, we tend to view history through, uh, in a general sense, through rose-colored glasses sometimes, and we think, you know, the things that happen elsewhere don't happen here. And uh, um, if you accept the, the light, uh, if you will, the light side of history or, the, or the, 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 the happier side, you have to accept the elements of darkness too. And, uh, and the War Measures Act, the internment of Japanese Canadians, um, uh, as you mentioned also, they weren't alone in that, but predominantly Japanese Canadians were interned. Uh, Italian and some Eastern European uh, as well tied into that, um, but you know it does it does create uh, a different perspective when you look back in time and start to think about what happened here at home. And then you also mentioned about making parallels to today's world, and I'm sure you do that. Um, but you know, anti-Semitism um, or you had a better term for it than that, but uh, it's never far behind, it seems. Uh, it, it seems to, to rear its ugly head continuously and uh, almost as if we haven't learned a lesson. And, and maybe that's where teaching comes to play in this. Uh, you, you are teaching a lesson, uh, you know, the, to use the war term, lest we forget. Uh, I know that comes out of the First World War, but perhaps that ties in very relevantly to the discussion of, of, of war today. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um... The, the importance of, of history, from my perspective, is using it as a way of, ex of explaining what we're doing right now and how things get to where they get. I mean, like I said, it wasn't automatic. It wasn't this, you know, this bad guy Hitler rises to power and invades France in, uh, or is Poland and then France in 1939. There's, I mean, there's a fair bit of support for the Nazi party in Canada and in fact, the United States where there was a very famous, massive sold out rally at Madison Square Gardens, which, you know, Nazi banners were flying everywhere and the 
and Zeke Heil and the Nazi salute was happening all over the place. I mean, it was not uncommon to have that sort of level of sympathy. That's the extreme, but in, in the, the more mainstream, you had um, people like our Prime Minister, uh, Mackenzie King, um, and openly expressing his admiration for what Hitler has done for his people in Germany. And, and of course, on a more odious note, the, uh, he, we also have a, a liberal minister who, when asked how many um, Jewish refugees Canada would accept after the St. Louis incident, um, his answer was, none is too many. I mean, that's a rather extreme sort of statement to make. And um, sadly, it's over the last couple of years, doesn't sound as extreme as it once did when I first began teaching this subject 20 years ago. I mean, it's, again, that sort of level of language and that sort of um, behavior has become more acceptable again. And we see the rise of right-wing populist parties in Europe and, and to some degree the rise of right-wing populism in, in the United States. And so again, it's, yeah, history is repeating itself. We're not, we're not uh, willing to learn from the mistakes of the past. And, uh, and that's something that I always try to highlight. Well, I, I mean, kudos to you, because I think that's the, that, that is the onus on us as community historians today to make sure that we do remember the paths that we've already walked. Um, the, uh, to jump back into our, our, our primary subject for, for this episode and, and the Second World War, um, you mentioned you both approach it from a timeline perspective and a thematic perspective. Uh, I'm interested in, in kind of a, a timeline for our listeners today to kind of um, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm putting you on the spot a bit for this, but uh, from it's Canada okay, involved for September. What was that? Sorry. Sorry. This is good prep for September. There we go. There we, but return to school and however that looks is right around the corner. So um, from uh, from a timeline perspective, uh, can you maybe give us a, a broad overview of Canada's involvement in the Second World War? Are there are there high points? Are there uh, major engagements that you that you focus on? kind of the, the, uh, the moments within the greater war. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if you can walk us through kind of uh, an outline of, of what it is you talk about and what is significant sure. from the Canadian perspective. Yeah, and, 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 you've, and exactly the Canadian perspective is what's important. There's a temptation to kind of go hog wild on World War II. It tends to be a popular subject, not just for students, but for teachers. And uh, the Canadian participation can sometimes be lost in the, you know, in the, in the mix because it's such a broad topic. Um, but we begin, once the war started, we begin, well, we look at the causes of the war and we examine the causes of the war internationally. And then once war is declared, we look at Canada's response. We look at its declaration, its mobilization. We uh, look at the, the total war theory, the idea that all industry and basically what Canada did in declaring uh, the War Measures Act was uh, martial law. And this gave the government unprecedented powers to control every aspect of society and the economy in Canada to prepare uh, itself on a war footing. And so we, we take a look at that and, 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 and with little hints of um, how that might be abused going forward, a little kind of um, foreshadowing there. But um, we look at the home front and the war effort. Uh, so then the role of families and recycling and, and reusing and, and all those sorts of things, victory gardens and all those sorts of things. Um, with regards to the war itself, um, after we discuss mobilization, we do focus. I, I choose uh, battles that are significant battles, but particularly significant battles that involve Canada. Everything from the, uh, the Battle of the Atlantic, which spans the duration of the war and Canada's role as uh, convoy, uh, providing the convoys for the uh, shipments coming from North America to Europe. And we uh, look at, of course, uh, Juneau Beach and D-Day. We look at Ortona. We look at um, the liberation of Holland. And, um, and so we, we do touch on several major battles. We also touch on the losses. And you know, we just recently um, uh, commemorated the, uh, the Battle of Dieppe, which happened earlier on this week in 1943. And so we discussed that as well. And um, I'm always mindful of being able to um, bring these soldiers to life. And so similarly to what we do in World War I is we introduce uh, individuals who by name and uh, what they did prior to the war and what they did during the war and whether or not they lived. So, you know, for Dieppe, you know, the list of casualties, the list of those taken prisoner and whatnot, uh, we go over that, we discuss that, and we kind of put that in perspective when you think about what an incredible tragedy it was. And, um, and, and we also look at some more interesting uh, aspects of the war, though I always like to talk about Camp X in Whitby, which is yep. the, uh, the spy base that was set up by the British 
originally to entice um, sympathetic Americans into the war, but then afterwards to train spies to go into Nazi-occupied Europe. And of course, a lot of famous people came out of that. Um, Lisa which Ian Fleming, the creator of uh, the James Bond series, was somebody who was trained in Camp X. Um, and and also Rod Dahl from James and the Giant Peach, who would have known a children's writer, was a guy who was literally licensed to kill. The kids get a kick out of that. They know that James and the Giant Peach, they know all those stories, but they didn't know this guy was a <laughs> killer. So, uh, I was going to say, I remember the, uh, the, a man named Intrepid, a man called Intrepid. That was the... William Stevenson. Yep. And he, yeah. Absolutely. And um, sadly, the, my students aren't familiar with the movie or the book, but uh, he's our Canadian content in that, in that particular yeah. story. So we talk about that. And then, of course, the role of women um, is, is covered. Not just the role of women in uh, working in the factories and, and whatnot, but even the role of, I mean, few people know that uh, women flew solo flights uh, across the Atlantic uh, unescorted and for hours at a time, completely out of contact with any sort of communication on the ground as they delivered uh, planes that were built here in, um, well, in Malton uh, over to Europe. And this was done by women and they ran the risk of being intercepted by um, German fighters uh, as soon as they reached the, uh, the coast. But this was done on a regular basis. And these are truly unsung heroes. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just reaching for a book actually, now that you mention it. Uh... Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, I just started it myself, but uh, speaking on that subject of uh, taking planes from here to there, uh, Ocean Bridge, Ferry wow. Command. Uh, this, um, uh, I've just started it, so it's hard to give it a recommendation, I'm <laughs> literally just beginning, but this is uh, the organization that took the, uh, the Finnish aircraft from places like Victory Aircraft, um, the base of operations in Canada was in Montreal, uh, just outside of Montreal, and the aircraft would be assembled there and then flown from there over l different routes, but largely I Greenland, Iceland, into Scotland, and then from Scotland they'd be transferred to the local distribution pilots for, I, I don't know the name of the structure of that yet, uh, which would then take those planes to the locations in which they would serve out of. Um, but they had to get there first, <laughs> and uh, 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 something called, called Ferry Command, uh, and so, sorry, I just reached for it because I didn't... Well, you're going to have to loan that to me. I will, yes, and I'll have to get it back from you, too. That's probably the bigger challenge. Uh, the, um, the, uh, but, the, I mean, they're, they're, they're fascinating things. I mean, we're just delving into subjects relating to Victory Aircraft and the Lancaster Bomber. Um, you know, 430 Lancaster bombers were produced in, uh, in Malton, um, the, the absolute workhorse of the British bombing fleet, um, and uh, with a, a very strong Canadian perspective. Um, and of course, we have Small Arms Limited in, in Mississauga as well, and just, you know, to mention briefly, but uh, uh, in your teachings, um, and in, in, sorry, I preface it a little bit. In my own understanding of the war, in my own education, it, it largely focuses on Europe um, and you know the, the 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 fight against Nazi Germany and uh, and the Axis powers and and the like. And um, but my own knowledge is is, is paled in, uh, it pales when it comes to uh, the Pacific War and against Japan. Do you touch on that in your in your teachings as well? And yeah, it's, and unfortunately, it's part of the, the, the kind of downside of Canada's involvement. We talk about the, um, the attack on Hong Kong, uh, which is in around uh, the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, differing by only one day. And we look at the Winnipeg Rifles and the regiments that uh, served on Hong Kong Island during that time. Um, and we also talk about the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, like I said, I, I tend to focus on the... Um, Canadian contribution and there, while there was uh, participation of Canadian troops in other theaters of war and to a limited degree in places like India and whatnot as well, the, the major um, participation was in Europe. That's where we, we began uh, with the invasion of Italy, in fact, is where Canada began its, um, its, its involvement in, in the war. Uh, so outside of Hong Kong and uh, a few other minor engagements in South Asia, there isn't too much that I cover. Now, mind you, it depends on the class that I'm teaching there. I had in the past um, for uh, certain classes offered an opportunity to learn more about Pearl Harbor, for instance, because, right. because of the movie that was out at the time, uh, kids were more familiar and they were likely to take a little more interest in it. But um, yeah, so 
not not so much not as much as i have uh, wanted to and i'm digging for uh, more meaningful canadian contributions in other theaters of war uh, i hope to do that a little bit more in the future but as it stands no it is largely uh europe and western europe as yeah. Um, yeah, of course yeah i mean you have uh, the mediterranean as well and mm -hmm. uh uh, well, that's, yeah, with the invasion of Italy, um, yeah. Sicily, and Ortona and whatnot, we, we do cover that as well. You have, uh, just to share with you, and I know I've done this in the past with the First World War, and I look forward to doing this with you and, and other teachers regarding the Second World War. Uh, we've identified from Mississauga 89 fallen uh, to date uh, for the Second World War. Um, one of those, uh, a casualty, uh, a, a pilot um, in India um and uh, a, a casualty of a, of a plane crash on landing in burma um it begs the question you know uh, what was his job there uh, and and we'll actually explore that in another segment on today's program so you gotta stay tuned because we're oh, gonna talk about uh, the, this pilot and, and kind of the, uh, the these broader connections again we, we, we often think in terms of Europe for obvious reasons, um, but uh, there are those those broader connections, like you said, Hong Kong, and you know uh, there were uh, Canadian ships involved in the uh, in, in the Pacific and uh, and the sailors therein, and so you, you, I mean it's it's it, it's it truly is a world war. I mean this mm -hmm. is span the globe, but perhaps uh, you know in, well not perhaps in, in greater extent than did the first world war. Um, the, the Second World War truly did span span the globe, and so we look at it. Uh, we didn't want to let this opportunity for this program go by without making recognition to the 75th anniversary of the cessation of the, of the Second World War. Um, one of the, one of the challenges I find, and, and, and there might be a question in here, so just bear with me for a moment. Um, in the we recognize Remembrance Day uh, on November 11th. Uh, of each year, uh, formerly known as Armistice Day, but Remembrance Day, um, which of course connects to the armistice during the First World War and then subsequent conflicts that have taken place kind of piggyback onto that date uh, as, as national remembrance and uh, for good reason. Um, when it comes to the, the Second World War, we have multiple dates in a sense. Uh, we have the uh, VE Day victory in Europe on May 8th. We have uh, uh, Canada recognizes VJ Day, Victory in Japan, or Victory in the Pacific, VP Day, uh, on August 15th. Um, the, the United States recognizes uh, v, VJ Day uh, on September 2nd. Um, it, it, different dates associated with different aspects of the war, whether it would be the, the Declaration of Surrender or the actual signing of the Terms of Surrender. Um, and, and so, so you, you, you tend to have a singular date that's recognized in, in the First World War, and then all other conflicts kind of lumped onto that, um, where the Second World War is kind of a sliding scale in a sense. I don't know a better way of saying that. And so I, I'm just wondering how you connect uh, in the teaching aspect of, um, of, of a timeline that perhaps is uh, much more complicated than the First World War, if that makes sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it isn't. It's not as cut and dried as you say in the ending. And so while I do discuss the uh, both VE Day and VJ Day, um, I, I tend to uh, draw the war out a little bit into the Cold War unit. And um, I apologize, I need to get my phone on mute here. Um, not ready for the classroom yet. I am not ready for the classroom. <laughs> really, I'm not. But um, what I was going to say was, what I do with uh, the uh, victory in Japan is I actually, I mention, make mention of the dropping of the two atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the unit, but then I revisit it when we look at the development of the Cold War uh, and we look at the Manhattan Project and where that goes. So, um, yeah, it, there's no one day that we say this is when the war ends. And, you know, in a lot of ways, World War II just transforms into another war. There really is no peace from 1945 to 1946. By 1947, the Berlin air, air uh, lift is happening. And soon after that, we hear about the Gazenko affair. Right. So, um, so that, I mean, what I always say is that uh, old enemies renew their, their hate of each other as the Soviet Union and the West uh, begin vying for world domination now that their common enemy, the, the Nazis have been defeated. Right. So right. It's, it's sort of a continuation in that regard um, so there really isn't any one dramatic moment. Uh, that's that's a true sense of engaging with history, though, is that you don't nothing is encapsulated into itself. You always draw these connections. Uh, 
uh, stories influence other stories, people influence other people, the borders are artificial things in, in many ways, and uh, so are timelines, so are date stamps. Uh, I mean, I, I made reference to November 11th as Armistice Day. Well, that was not the end of the First World War either. First World War is not ending until June of 1919 when the actual peace treaty is signed. And then some would suggest that the First World War led into the Second World War because of the restrictions placed on Germany. So, yeah, you, you, you know, we, we do live in this fluid timeline. So it's hard to say, you know, that this is a put a, a date stamp on it. But again, uh, you know, connecting to, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, it, 2020, regardless of how you look at individual dates, is the 75th anniversary of uh, moments within the Second World War that were celebrated as the ending of that particular conflict. Um, and those are significant, I think, in the, in the larger sense of Canadian participation. And uh, uh, I mean, you can make some argument perhaps to the emergence of a national identity, which would lead its way, you know, within, I don't know, I'm not good with math, but about 12 years later into the development of our own flag. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, what it was to be Canadian and being something different than being British. Yeah, well, uh, and I mean, even our, our separate role in, uh, in D-Day, you know, with Juno Beach. And, um, and, and, and the role of our, our statesmen, let's say at the time, our statesmen uh, post-war in developing a new Europe. I mean, we had, um, we had developed a, a very strong diplomatic corps, a uh, very respected diplomatic corps at that time. And um, often we were the conduit, you know, speaking of the Cold War, while we obviously sided on the West and our allies were, were Western Europe and the United States, we were often the go-between when it came to the more sensitive discussions between East and West. Um, and again, that perhaps culminated in the uh, aversion of the Suez crisis and the creation of peacekeepers. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot, I mean, you just can't, like I say again, you just can't stop talking about World War II because the after effects reverberate arguably until today. I mean, everything we do today, whether all the geopolitics of the day, all the, um, the political struggles and the military struggles that are happening today, the economy, all of it was developed or set into uh, set into motion post-war. Right. You know, and for yeah, yeah. you just wonder. I mean, uh, you know, we, you and I, as historians and the, the the history community, uh, we're not so good at the prognostication part of things. But uh, the uh, you know, we have the luxury of being able to look backwards and making these connections, but. Um, it's one thing for me to talk about it, but uh, I would say kudos to you for the teaching of it. And, uh, uh, you know, even if a kernel of what you've spoken about today is retained by, by, by students that passed before you, and, and of course, multiple other history teachers that do an exemplary job as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we make those understandings that things do not happen in isolation. And, uh, there's a reason that we, you know, there's that old saying, sorry, I'm stumbling on my words about the, the old saying, if, if you don't remember it, you're doomed to, prefer to repeat it. Oh, absolutely. Um, sometimes when you do remember it, you still repeat it. So it's kind of, uh, you know, modern politics uh, can play into that as well. So, but kudos to you. And, and I really appreciate, um, is there anything else you wanted to add? Because no, you, you, you actually just reminded me of one element when you were speaking of, you know, it's, it's, the nature of Canada's participation in the war was such that a majority of the conversation centered around Western Europe, as it did in the First World War. However, um, my school being situated where it is, is a highly multicultural area. And so I'm speaking to a class in front of me that uh, is representative of the entire world. Now, the war was, as you had uh, acknowledged, uh, a, a truly world war. So um, what I attempt to do to engage those students is yes, talk about the Canadian participation, um, but I also, you know, focus on those parts of the world in which my students come from and at least discuss it a bit. So, I mean, we have a very large Filipino community. We talk about the Filipino experience during the war. Um, we have kids from uh, North Africa. We talk about the war in North Africa. So, there, there's definitely, while there's not always a, a direct Canadian link to various developments and events during the war, there is a way of me demonstrating to the students that they in fact have a history that does go back to the war, regardless of where they came from. So um, that's important that I do that. I feel it's very important that I engage them in something that is meaningful to them and uh, not some kind of far off abstract idea. 
I, I always, the, the Ontario Heritage Trust has a magazine called History Matters. And, you, you know, what, what a great byline, but, you know, history does matter, but individual stories that connect to that history matter as well. And, and uh, um, that's part of the Canadian identity because it, it is not something that's arrested in time. And, and uh, you know, again, kudos to you for involving the youth of today, regardless of their own backgrounds into the story that is is a Canadian story but is also wider than a Canadian story and uh, equally of value and equally uh, part of uh, you know, telling and remembering the significant moment in our in our collective histories so um, thank you. I, I, I thank you for your time um, thank you for your passion and your knowledge and being willing to share it I, you know that's it's one thing to have the knowledge, but it's another thing to share it. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, being an enthusiastic supporter of, uh, of 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 doing these kind of, of outreach things, and but we'll look on having you on in a, in a short period again to to talk about uh, the First World War. But uh, for today, thank you so much, and uh, and uh, look forward to chatting again. And uh, good luck prepping for school. I know it's around the corner, and you yes. probably don't want to think about it. And uh, um, more particularly in the times that we're in. Um, be well, be healthy, and be safe as you, as you go back. And uh, to everyone who's listening, the same. Uh, uh, be well, and uh, um, uh, hopefully we can uh, find some solace in wandering down memory lane and exploring history together. So. Well, thank you. I can tell you that teaching the Spanish influenza is going to have a lot more gravitas this time around than it had in previous years. I think students are going to appreciate it a lot more. Are you starting with that in September? <laughs> well, we do do it quite early on. We do. <laughs> Early on. It seems so, like an appropriate back to school topic right now. <laughs> I feel like leading with it, but uh, definitely it's something that we discussed very early on in the year. But I thank you very much for having me. I look forward to uh, joining you again. This was a great, uh, great time. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. Our first question this week on Ask a Historian actually focuses on um, matters of the home front uh, and uh, what had happened here at home. And there are a number of things that, uh, that took place at home. It's a fascinating thing to look at in terms of uh, life at home. One of the first one was uh, just the a manpower perspective with so many people volunteering and enlisting uh, for service in the, in the Second World War. Much like the First World War, there was a shortage of farm labor and historic Mississauga was uh, very much uh, a rural farming community at that time. Um, and it developed programs like farm cadets and farmerettes that brought students out from the urban areas in the summertime to help as farm hands. Uh, Mississauga was home also uh, through the Cooksville Brickyard, which was at Mavis and Dundas Street, to a small German prisoner of war uh, camp for uh, members of the German Merchant Marine. Um, there's also just from uh, just impacts at home, uh, there was a shortage of food products like butter, coffee, meat, and sugar. Uh, there were recycling initiatives uh, such as aluminum and scrap metal. Aluminum was used for something known as window screening, which uh, for, for pilots engaged in, in bombing raids over enemy territory, window screening was, was a lifesaver, literally. Um, a box of recycled tin foil shredded into tiny pieces would be slowly jettisoned from an airplane, a bomber, uh, flying over the English Channel. Um, and the falling pieces of the aluminum would confuse enemy radar. Um, ration books became a, a part of daily life uh, in order to uh, regulate the purchase of materials. Uh, ration books were introduced in 1941. Uh, for example, a pound of hamburger in 1941, you'd have to give the grocer a ration cube coupon that, uh, that proved that you could afford that amount and then pay the required price. Some rationing rates, uh, six ounces of butter per week per family, a half pound of a choice meat per week per family, or two and a half pounds of a cheap cut of meat per week, and, uh, and so on. But ration books were, were introduced in, in, in 1941. Maybe one of the most uh, important initiatives during the uh, Second World War was gas rationing, gasoline rationing. Um, strict rationing wasn't implemented until 1942, but beginning in 1941, uh, the sale of gas was restricted between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, on April 1st, 1942, gas rationing was, was introduced through ration books and uh, also the nationwide speed limit was lowered uh, to 40 miles per hour or 65 kilometers an hour. 
Um, Canadians were encouraged to carpool, uh, ride buses, walk or bike uh, to save on the gas consumption. Civilian bus trips were restricted to destinations within eight kilometers of their starting point. Uh, in the first year of gas rationing, uh, that was again 1942, Canadians were able to pair, curb their consumption of gas by 150 million gallons. Uh, incredible when you think of those things. Um, something known as the Air Raid Protection Organization was created in 1941. Uh, working in partnership with the Red Cross, they conducted first aid courses, educated the public on civil defense initiatives, enforced blackout conditions, and conducted air raid drills. The most important element of an air raid drill was total and complete darkness. Uh, heavy curtains to block out any light. Cars would pull off the road and, and, and turn off their headlights. There would be wardens ensuring people that, uh, ensuring people cooperated with, with the blackout drills. Um, and that might seem far from home, but there were air raid sirens in historic Mississauga. We've documented one at the corner, uh, having existed at one point at the corner of Lakeshore Road and, uh, and Dixie Road. Um, and so the ARP or the Air Raid Protection Organization we know was active in historic Mississauga. Um, one of our, our more well-known uh, tidbits, and uh, we have a question on this later and we'll expand on it, was uh, uh, home children. Uh, the children being sent uh, to safety out of Britain in fear of the Blitz, uh, uh, residing or, or coming to reside in historic Mississauga, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the program. Uh, Japanese internment, um, Japanese Canadians through the War Measures Act were, were, uh, were seen as uh, undesirable uh, residents or uh, enemy aliens, despite there being no evidence to support that whatsoever. Uh, several places within uh, historic Mississauga, the Hancock Woodlands, the Clarks Fruit Market, the Sheraton Nurseries became uh, destination points and uh, uh, for um, Japanese uh, interned or displaced Japanese Canadians, um, and they would work on those properties, uh, earning a wage, but uh, uh, having moved inland, and, and most of whom losing their homes and, uh, and, and properties and businesses and the like through through again the the, uh, the War Measures Act. Um, Malton Airport and Victory Aircraft were significant in uh, development of, of uh, uh, the war effort at home on the home front. Um, Victory Aircraft uh, was established in 1942 out of uh, what was known as the National Steel Car Company, um, and they were principally involved in the development of heavy bombers uh, for the war effort overseas. Uh, Miss Song was also home to the Commonwealth Air Training Plan, also in the Moulton Airport. Uh, cadets from Air Forces uh, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Britain, Poland, Norway, uh, Belgium, uh, and uh, Free French uh, also uh, trained here under the auspices of the RAF. Uh, the number one elementary flying school and the number one air observer school were located in Malton on Airport Road, just south of Derry Road. Uh, back to Victory Aircraft, uh, again, Crown Corporation formed in 1942, uh, developed heavy bombers for the Second World War, including the Lancaster bomber. A total of 430 bombers were produced at the Victory Aircraft plant in Malton. Um, the factory reached its production, uh, reached its peak uh, in 1943-44, and as many as 9,700 workers, a good third of whom were women, um, really, uh, the, the company played a, uh, a role in the changing, uh, 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 the changing dynamics, if you will, of women in the workforce during the Second World War. Uh, and along that theme, there's also the dimming and small arms limited, and we remember that on our landscape today by the, the, uh, the small arms building down on Lakeshore Road at the foot of Dixie Road. Uh, the, the Dominion Small Arms Limited uh, Munitions Factory began in 1941, and by 1943, the company employed 5,500 employees working in three shifts, producing 30,000 uh, units a month. Principally, their workforce was women, and they were from all over Canada. Uh, there were uh, pre prefabricated homes built for them in the community. There was a women's dormitory across the street. Um, and uh, over the course of the war, the company employed uh, over 14,000 workers producing 900,000 Lee Enfield No. 4 rifles and 126,000 Mark II Sten submachine guns, uh, as well as a, a, many other weapons and ammunition to support the war effort overseas. Wartime production ceased on December 31st of 1945, but we have the remnant today 
of uh, the Small Arms Inspection Building, uh, now part uh, owned by the city of Mississauga and part of the museums of Mississauga, as being a, uh, a remembrance of that time on our landscape. So that's just some of the initiatives that uh, took place on the home front and uh, a really remarkable uh, story and time uh, from, from that era. Thank you, Lena, for the question on uh, St. Hilda's all-girls school during the Second World War. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, during the Second World War, uh, the Glen Aaron Inn, or what was then known as Glen Aaron Hall, or the home of the Evans family, was uh, just uh, location-wise just uh, off what is now the College Way uh, near Mississauga Road, north of Dundas Street. Um, St. Hilda's school itself, um, uh, in, uh, in 1940, uh, 1941, during the height of the Blitz in Britain, uh, British parents often sent their children to Canada and other colonies across the Dominion for reasons of safety. Um, they were referred, uh, referred to as home children. One of the most prominent stories of home children, at least locally, was out of St. Hilda's school and its relocation to Arendelle. Uh, St. Hilda's was a girls' boarding school uh, in the town of Whitby uh, on the northeastern coast of England. It was decided by the school staff and the, and the parents uh, that the entire school, which included 160, 160 girls between the ages of 6 and 16, 12 teachers, and 27 boys, would relocate to Canada. Uh, Mary Evans, uh, an Arendelle resident, offered her country home, Glen Aaron Hall, uh, now the Glen Aaron Inn, uh, to the school as a resident, uh, residence and teaching facility. The school accepted the offer, although it wasn't enough space for all the students. Uh, Seventy girls and eight teachers were sent to Glen Aaron Hall in Arendelle, uh, and the rest of the students, uh, students were scattered throughout private residences elsewhere in Ontario and Quebec. Um, throughout the war, the students lived a routine life in Arendelle. In addition to their studies, they played winter sports, uh, they shopped at local stores, they attended Sunday services at St. Peter's Anglican Church in Arendelle, uh, they put on a, 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 a victory bond and fundraising rally at an Arendelle Community Hall. They, just, they became members of the community and uh, we've talked to many residents uh, of, uh, in Arendelle over the years that remember the time that St. Hilda's students were in Arendelle. Uh, the St. Uh, Hilda students remained in Arendelle until 1944 uh, when German forces had been pushed back uh, into, the, into the continent. It was deemed safe for them to return. Uh, so for about two and a half years, uh, St. Hilda's uh, girls' school from, uh, from uh, uh, Whitby uh, near Hornby, England, uh, were housed at the Glen Aaron Inn uh, in, uh, in historic Mississauga in Arendelle. Uh, and attended St. Peter's Anglican Church uh, just across the road and up the hill uh, for, for them. So just a neat connection to kind of the local uh, terms. We have a couple pictures of them as well, but uh, um, a short-lived moment in time in which St. Hilda's uh, Girls' School uh, from England made its home in historic Mississauga during the Second World War. Well, in this week on Ask a Historian, we are uh, delving again into the Second World War, and joining me right now is John Eigel, who is a researcher here with Heritage Mississauga and a uh, university student at McMaster University and has done an exemplary job delving into a mess of files on the Second World War, trying to make sense of several years worth of research by many researchers in the community. Uh, a nod out to Ivan Kovacevic, uh, who for the work that he's done, and Kathy Baker and others who have contributed to the research over time. But our focus at Heritage Mississauga is really on uh, documenting the fall and what we've loosely returned, uh, termed as our boys. Um, uh, starting with the First World War, uh, we didn't work chronologically necessarily, but from the First World War we delved into uh, the Northwest and Riel rebellions, uh, into the Fenian raids, uh, also the rebellion of 1837, uh, and even touched on the Boer War. But uh, now under uh, John's direction and the work of, of uh, others before him, making sense of the 
massive amount of material that we've uncovered and continue to uncover on the Second World War. And the important thing to remember is that it is a work in progress. Uh, and so even as we have done this research over a number of years, uh, new stuff constantly comes to light. So it's, it's almost in a sense like we're never totally done. Um, but the focus of the project from a virtual war memorial perspective is to remember those that came from historic Mississauga, those that served and those that fell. Um, and uh, again, loosely titled Our Boys, Mississauga Remembers. And uh, along that theme, we've taken a, a couple of questions and, uh, and John is here to guide us through uh, the, the tremendous research that he, is, he has done, as well as the, uh, for lack of a better word, the compilation of, of, of material that you've gone through uh, and the literally thousands of files. Do you remember off the top of your head how many files were transferred in terms of gathered material prior, John? I think it was just shy of 4,000 and I've brought it up closer to 10. Wow. And, um, and so anyone who's interested for more, uh, particularly those names that were uh, from the Second World War that are on Mississauga Cenotaphs and War Memorials, there's a good chance we have material of them. Our, our dream is to find photographs. That's not always possible, but it's something that we work on and to develop biographies for our fallen soldiers. Um, so thank you, John, for joining us. And, uh, yeah, my and, pleasure. Uh, uh, we'll have some fun wandering down memory lane for the Second World War. So our first mm. question this week is from Darren, and, uh, and uh, thank you, Darren, for reaching out to us. And uh, you're asking about uh, the fallen and, uh, and the number of soldiers who uh, served from Historic Mississauga and fell from Historic Mississauga. And, uh, we're a little vague on the, first, on the, on the, on the service number, but uh, on the fallen, we have a pretty good idea. Uh, from a national average perspective, um, there was uh, 1,159,000 uh, soldiers who uh, enlisted and served in the Canadian Army during the First World War and the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, 44,090 lost their lives to an average of about 4% of, uh, of soldiers did not return home. Uh, from service. Uh, we don't know the total number of enlistments, but average that, you know, possibly 4% again fell from historic Mississauga uh, gives us a total of 89 names. And so, John, I, I, I turn it over to you from a, a fallen perspective, if we can uh, address uh, Darren's question here this week. So in terms of the, the number of fallen we have, it's, as you've said, it's definitely a work in progress. Um, and so even, even this morning, I realized that our number might be one or two off. Um, it is constantly changing, but as you said, we have we have about eighty nine that we can confirm for a fact, um, and and there's really no strong like there's no one Mississauga area that stands out as a birthplace um, because I I found that a lot of the the men and women came from kind of all over, be that they were born in Europe or or various parts of, of Canada. So I mean, the one that it, the most uh, uh, common birthplace was Port Credit, but that was really only eight people that were actually born in Port Credit proper. Right. Um, but then if you look at residents at enlistment, um, which is, is listed on uh, enlistment attestation forms, um, Port Credit really stands out with 26, whereas the, the next closest is Lakeview at 16 and then Cookville, Cookville at 11. So it really isn't, there's no one huge center in Mississauga. Um, and often you encounter people that lived kind of on the outskirts, like in Toronto or, or just outside Mississauga, but their family lived in Mississauga. So you have a lot of people who are on um, cenotaphs in, in the Mississauga area, and you'll find newspaper mention of them coming to visit because social notes were a thing back in the time of the Second World War, right? So it's like such and such spent the weekend visiting his mother in Port Credit, right? So you know that they existed and that they have a connection, but they didn't necessarily live here. Yeah. And we, sometimes we don't know why a name ends up on a cenotaph either. Mm -hmm. you, you get, I think there's some curiosities of uh, unknowns of, you know, here's a name on a, you know, say a Port Credit cenotaph, uh, yeah. but we don't, we don't understand why it's there. Uh, mm -hmm. That happens too. That, yeah, that's, that's a big problem I've run into. And that was uh, kind of the issue that I ran into this morning when I was doing my quick review before this. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely been a challenge finding, especially with so many of the common names. Like, I mean, I'm, my name is John, so I can't really speak, but <laughs> there's a lot of like John Williams and, and things like that, where it's like, which one are you? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's been a, a fun challenge, um, but it's, it's been fulfilling. And what was the, what's the average age of our fallen? If we, if we take the name, the 89, or you were saying might be two more, so say 89 to 91 names, what's the average age of the fallen from historic Mississauga that we have? I found, I found about 24 years. 
Okay. Um, so same age as me, which is kind of hard to hear. It is the youth of a community, really, when you think mm -hmm. of it. And, uh, uh, you know, personally, I've done a lot more research uh, previously on the First World War than the Second. We're, we're delving into the Second now. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at things like uh, marriage records and, you know, who might have had children. Again, mm -hmm. at, at 24 years of age, it, it is the youth of a community. And, and the, mm -hmm. you know, many of them will be unmarried, uh, most likely. And, um, you, you'd mentioned too, we have, um, uh, uh someone who was underage, uh, yeah. and, uh um, that happens too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. We had a 15 year old. Yeah. It, it's just, it just is remarkable. And so I know we're going to delve into some of the, 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 the stories and personalities of, of, of the, uh, of some of the individuals as well. But Darren, just that, that is to answer your question. Um, uh, we have, uh, 89 confirmed fallen, possibly 91. If we, if we count, uh, the kind of ongoing research, uh, mm -hmm. that number may change in time. Um, uh, research never truly ends and more and more documentary evidence is, 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 uh, being made available. Uh, the Second World War, from a from a document perspective, is still covered within the 90 years of, of, of uh, uh, kind of Freedom Protection or Information Protection Act, uh, and so we don't have the access to uh, the, the the records that we do, uh, such as the First World War. But but more and more is coming available. And more people are are. Not, are connecting to that anniversary. And of course, 2020 uh, marks the 75th anniversary of the cessation of the war. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, but again, it, it is a remarkable story. And, and uh, sometimes when you throw numbers out there, they become kind of cold facts, if we, if mm -hmm. you will. But even if we look at the 89, that is 89 young people from our community that did not return home. Um, 89 families that would have mourned those that were lost. Um, becomes part of the identity of this place um, and the remembrance of this place, uh, and and so that that is uh, something to to remember as we go forward. It's not just statistics. Um, every one of those names is is a life, is a family, is a friend, is a brother, is a son, is a, is in some cases uh, uh, daughters as well, um, and uh, very much uh, something to remember and to pay respects for. Uh, as we develop the, the, the virtual war memorial perspective. So thank you, Darren, for your question. And um, uh, yeah, we look forward to sharing more with you. Our next question on Ask a Historian from Evan, and thank you, Evan, for reaching out to us. And you were asking about uh, medals and, and decorations or commendations for those that served in the Second World War uh, from Historic Mississauga. And, uh, again, research is ongoing. Uh, I wouldn't say we have a, a final tally, but we have a couple that jumped out at us. And, and John, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and, and, and uh, what you've uncovered in your research in regards to uh, commendations and medals. Um, so this one is, is definitely, it's a good way to show just the uncertainty that we're dealing with with this. So the one individual that stands out as someone who was 100% uh, confirmed as having been mentioned was uh, Cyril Askin, who was a, a gunner in an anti-tank regiment. Um, he landed on P-Day, so June 6th, and he was, he was killed on the 22nd of June, uh, I believe just outside Calais. Um, and he was mentioned in dispatches in recognition of, quote, gallant and distinguished service on um, March 2nd, 1945. Um, and there's no real mention of what he did to um, earn this commendation, but these were, these were, these were submitted by uh, commanding officers and um, they were published by, I believe it was the London Gazette. Okay. Um, and so to get the actual record of that, it's behind a, a quite steep paywall. Um, so I've done everything else I can. Um, that's the best we know about him. He was born in 1907 in Arendelle, um, April 30th. Um, and then the other two that jumped out at me during my research were um, George Bailey, who actually survived the war. Um, he lived to be about 90 um, in, in uh, Streetsville. Um, he survived the war, was mentioned in dispatches, and received the Distinguished Service Order, um, DSO. Yeah. And then, and then there's, there's, I like to call him the mysterious David or Davis Thompson, who I've 
been completely unable to track down in any certainty. Uh, it seems my predecessors have had similar struggles. He uh, was mentioned in dispatches. Um, I know it was his service number that was mentioned in dispatches, but there's confusion in the sense that he was he was about, I believe it was 17 in 1918. Um, and there's some documentation that leads me to suspect that he tried to serve in the First World War and was sent home, like he was found out and sent back home. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to track down because there's mention of him, of a, of a name having served very briefly in the First World War and then that happening. Um, and then he's casually mentioned in dispatches once in the Second World War, but it's, it's very murky. I can't, I've been unable to find any firm documentation on him. So one of the, the fun things we can do with a program such as this is to throw it out to our audience. Mm -hmm. uh, not only in terms of Cyril Askin, who we do have documentation for, but you know we lack kind of the specifics on um, what he was his, uh, his, his recognition was for, um, mm -hmm. and if indeed he lost his life as a result of whatever serv whatever he had done in terms of his gallant service, we we, we don't know the, the circumstances of the actual uh, recognition, um, mm -hmm. but also to the unknowns uh, to Davis slash David Thompson, um, and uh, you know what can our audience, if anyone has gathered that information, share with us? So uh, Evan, I apologize, it's not maybe a, a conclusive answer um, and, and maybe yet more to come, um, but that's the nature of a research project that is ongoing and, and uh, we, we look to uncover and cover more. Um, and you know, one of the things we're, we're not touching on today, uh, but perhaps in future episodes are maybe some of the, the, the specific moments in time during the First World War, like, like Juno Beach. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Mississauga soldiers were at Juno Beach and, uh, and, uh, and the Normandy landings. And um, you know, that, that uh, significant moment of the, the change of the tide, if you will, in terms of the, of, of the war in Europe, um, uh, you know, we have those remembrances of those who served and those who lost their lives in those moments in time, uh, much a part, or, a part of a, a much bigger picture um, that also involves uh, recommend, uh, consideration and, and recognition of, of their service in moments of extreme duress. Uh, and so it's just, it, it is fascinating. And yes, we can look at the individual medals and we should, uh, should recognize those that serve, but also understand that uh, we don't have all of that information yet. And, uh, and again, we look forward to delving into that uh, further. Uh, and, and most likely we will find more uh, as we go forward. So uh, again, thank you for the question, Evan, and uh, and and John. Thanks for the, the the delving, the deep delve into some of these things, and the mysterious Davis Thompson or David Thompson, and uh, who knows, maybe one of our listeners might actually uh, be able to shed some light on that, uh, and uh, and others, uh, if there are others that we haven't uh, uh, haven't mentioned in this. Our next segment this week is uh, changing gears a little bit again, and uh, we're going to offer some uh, quick and uh, quick facts of history relating to the Second World War, uh, kind of uh, did you knows or unusual facts uh, that uh, that John has uncovered in in his tremendous research. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to John, and we've got uh, five things that John has pulled out as being absolutely fascinating to him, uh, and he's going to share them with us. So uh, five did you knows on the on the Second World War connecting to historic Mississauga and over to you, John. So to begin with, um, I thought it would be cool to talk about our, uh, our indigenous fallen. Um, so we had two individuals who happened to be from the same reserve. So they were from the Alderville First Nation Reserve up near uh, Coburg. Um, their names were Rifleman Arthur William Beaver and Sergeant Wilburn Chubb. Um, they both lived in Clarkson. Um, Wilburn, who, who was lovingly named or, or known as Whip, um, he, he worked on a farm for, I believe it was about 15 years, just outside of Clarkson. Um, he lived in the area with his wife and, and uh, children. Um, his wife's name was Jesse, I believe. Um, and then Arthur Beaver, he and his brother both lived in Clarkson. I don't know if they lived together, but they were both in Clarkson. Um, so Arthur Beaver served with the Queen's Own Rifles. Um, he was killed near Calais. Um, and interestingly, he worked as a florist before the war. Um, but I, I, uh, did a bit more uh, digging into the Alderville First Nation Reserve. Um, and I found that they have um, what seems to be a really um, 
beautiful memorial that they've constructed. Um, it's a big uh, stand. Um, and they had, in addition to um, Arthur and Wilburn, um, they had another 60 individuals who served during the Second World War, which 60. I don't, 60. Um, I, don't, I don't know the population of the reserve, um, but it, it currently it's, it's very small. Like it's, it's around 1,200 people, I think. So um, I don't, as I said, I don't know how the population has changed, but um, that's a significant portion of their population. Um, and it's, it's, I, thought, I thought the fact that um, Wilburn uh, Chubb, who had, had, he served with the Irish Regiment of Canada and died of wounds in Italy, um, both of these men were injured at least once, like significantly injured in combat before they were later killed. Um, so they were clearly tough individuals who could keep up the fight. Um, but I found it interesting that uh, Chubb worked his way up to the rank of sergeant as an indigenous individual, um, which in, in the 20th century can only have been a, quite the feat um, for an, an individual of color to uh, achieve that recognition. So I thought that was worth noting. And they both appear on the Port Credit Cenotaph, I believe you said? Uh, yes, yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah they, well, they were. So just to, just to jump in, I always think of war memorials and cenotaphs in a way as a kind of cheat sheets of history in a sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, they offer the names of individuals. They don't offer the, the imagery or the personality or the biography, but they, they give you a name, they give you a starting point. Um, and, you know, these two individuals, uh, Arthur Beaver and, uh, and uh, what was it, Wib? Wib, Wib was the nickname? Wilburn Wib Yeah, Chubb. Wilbur Wib Chubb. Um, you know, individuals who have connections to two communities, uh, one here at home and in, in Mississauga where they live, but one further abroad at the Alderville First Nation. And, uh, you know, connections are, are fascinating to, to delve into. And, you know, things we don't know is what brought them to Clarkson in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so th we have these, these connections to these two individuals. So great finds on, on that. And uh, uh, so on to our next, did you know? So um, the next one was something that I had absolutely no idea about. I had never heard of. Um, it's pilot officer Ernest William Bernard Carlson. Um, and uh, he was born in 1923 in Hamilton um, and was killed uh, June 8th, 1944 in France. Um, he flew for 138 Squadron uh, of the Royal Canadian Air Force, which was actually um, an RAF attachment, um, flying out of RAF Thamesford which is a field I had never heard of. Um, and so I did a bit of digging and found the name Gibraltar Farm, which also attached to Tempsford, which was confusing because who's flying out of a farm. And so I, I, I found, um, apparently, RAF Tempsford was, it's, it's touted as the most secretive air base of the entire Second World War. Um, it uh, was specifically designed to look like an ordinary farm, hence Gibraltar Farm. Um, and they launched, um, it, so it was the hub for the first two RAF special duty squadrons, which were created under the, the SOE, the Special Operations Executive, which was specifically created by Winston Churchill to try and aid resistance fighters in uh, Europe. So what they would do is they would um, fly, the, so they had two squadrons. They had 138 Moon Squadron because they tended to only fly during a full moon because um, they needed light and uh, 161 Tempsford Taxi Special Duty Squadrons. Um, so the, the two squadrons flew different aircraft. 138 flew um, Handley Page Halifax bombers, um, which were large multi-engine aircraft. And so they would fly in um, at treetop level, which is why they needed a full moon so that they could see what they were doing with a map on their lap. Um, and they would drop off um, those specifically were usually dropping off supplies and agents. So they would drop weaponry and then whatever supplies of warfare you need and, and special agents to resistance fighters. They flew from England um, at their farthest. They actually flew to Czechoslovakia, which is treetop level in the middle of the night, um, effectively blind, which is, is quite impressive. And then um, 161, which got the name Tempsford Taxi, they flew um, much smaller single prop um, Westland Lysanders, which um, had a, uh, a permanently uh, affixed metal ladder hanging out the side of it. So what it would do is it would, they would drop down onto, it could take off and land in the size of about a football field. 
Yeah. Um, so what they would do is they would come in at night and they would they would drop off operatives, whatever, special agents, um, resistance fighters, and then so they would do that on the the landing roll, turn around, and as yeah. they began their takeoff roll, they would have, um, I think they they called them uh, VIPs. Uh, special agents um, and, and resistance fighters who needed to get out of Europe um, would pile back into the aircraft. And so this lone pilot would do these taxi runs on, on the whatever field they could find and then get out um, and get back to England. And so during the course of the Second World War, the crews of RAF Thamesford, so that was 138 and 161 Squadron, um, they actually dropped off just shy of 1,500 operatives into mm -hmm. Europe and removed uh, 575 safely to England, wow. um, which to me is just incredible. And so um, this, this our boy, uh, Ernest Carlson, was killed in June 8th. Um, because of the secrecy surrounding it all, I'm not sure if that was on his way there or on his return, um, but he did go down with a, with a rather full crew, so. So was he was he in uh, one of the, uh, the 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 Halifax bombers or was he? In, yeah, in yeah, the the Hamley Page Halifax. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and where was uh, you mentioned he was born in Hamilton, I believe. Uh, yeah. Uh, where was uh, did he reside in historic Mississauga or family here? Or? Yeah, he had family. He's on the Port Credit Cenotaph. Okay. He had three brothers and six sisters, so it's there was there was lots of family all over the place and. Okay. Yeah, um, and and again, uh, pilots the, the the rate of attrition for pilots was much higher than the uh, the infantry men is mm -hmm. is is hard to classify uh, sacrifice in that sense, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot even just in training exercises. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're on on to our third fact. Um, so another another aviation related one, and I kind of picked this one because um, it it emphasizes both the home front and and the war effort abroad um and specifically it, it it's in relation to victory aircraft which i know you're working on yep um so this is sergeant george douglas lees um he was a, a gunner in a lancaster mark one um the the me 7 730 so if, if you ever want to look into it um but his wife um they were from sudbury but his wife in all likelihood worked at victory aircraft in malton um she's listed as working at a, at a war factory in Malton um, during the time of the war. Yeah. Um, and so he was he was downed uh, over Germany on a, on, during a raid on Schweinfurt, um, which I'm sure I butchered the pronunciation of. Um, and it, it, his was very much kind of your cut and dry. They flew over and they were lost so many, like so many, but um, as was the case with most downed aircraft, you, um, after the war came to an end, they, they, the Allies began searching for crews, and so we, we, we were able, I was able to find the documents that detailed the, the search for the, the remains of the crew, and they were found. Um, he does have a known grave now, which is, which is always good to see, um, but it's, it's, he disappeared overseas, and, and his wife was back home um, working at Victory, and kind of just lost track of her um, often. It's got to be... Sorry, uh, it's got to be such a challenge too. If you think about it, I mean, here are two halves of a fa of, of of a family of a partnership, uh, both enlisting to serve in different capacities in the first in the Second World War. One on the home front um, in wartime production, and the other overseas, and yet linked in the sense that you know if she indeed is working at Victory Aircraft, which we believe because it makes sense from the geography and from the reference to Winston Hall and and mm -hmm. others she's producing the aircraft that he is flying um, mm -hmm. and that he is lost in. And so, it, you know, there, there has to be uh, there, there's a resonance there. There's a story there to be told. And, and you know, you wonder, like myself, I'm looking into the production of, of the aircraft and the, the operation of Victory Aircraft, but news of lost aircraft would have reached home too. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the sense of pride and ownership in developing these aircraft, but you, you also have to extrapolate that there must have been a sense of tremendous loss for those that were building these aircraft to know that some were not returning home. Um, and uh, I, I know there was name christening ceremonies and fanfare at the rollout of aircraft at their height. Victory Aircraft was producing one bomber a day. Um, they produced 430 bombers for the overseas effort uh, uh, 
over 100 of them were lost in action. So you're, you're just, uh, it's, it's an amazing number when you think about it, but you wonder also at the human cost, uh, not only in terms of loss, but also just emotions uh, at home. Um, and these people like, uh, like his wife, uh, what was her name? The, the, um, I, let me pull it up. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, my fault is. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I'll find it. We have two pictures of him, so that's good. always good to see. Um, Margaret Elaine Lees. Margaret Elaine Lees. So Margaret Elaine, uh, not from here, born in Sudbury. Uh, um, I don't know if she was born in Sudbury, but they were living in Sudbury. He was born in Blind River. Okay. So not far, not far. That's up in the uh, northern Ontario. So yeah. Uh, but but regardless, not from here, but came to work here, came to reside here for a period of time, um, became a resident of this place, um, and uh, what becomes of her, we're not entirely sure at this point. But uh, uh, nonetheless, that they have their connections here and their remembrances to this place in time during the war years, and and that's. Part of our story as well what brings people here and the that that multinational perspective of employment of wartime industries uh and mississauga at home of course to several wartime industries during the second world war but uh, becomes part of our our, our our bigger picture story of life on the home front and those connections to loss overseas uh quite strong all right number four well one one oh, final note here, actually yeah, yeah, um, in, in connection to the loss at home um i found that through my research often when um, crew member is lost in a large aircraft such as this or a, family, uh, a Halifax, whatever, um, they, uh, the, the RCF would often send home a list of other of the other um, servicemen and, okay. and um, the contact information of their families so that there was there was a good sense of, of being able to, I don't know if it was grieve as a community or, or find out more about one another, but it, it um, from a research perspective that, that I found that really um, drove home the human toll of one single aircraft going down. And it, it's also useful because I think uh, Sergeant Lee's was an instance where the documentation on him wasn't very strong. Right. Um, but I was able to, through documentation on, on his crew members, find a lot, find out a lot more about him um, in, in passing reference. Right. So it's, it's, I thought that was worth noting. Um, but then, yeah, shall we move on? Please, yeah. Okay, um, so another another flyboy, uh, Flight Officer Leonard Stewart Stockwell. Um, he was killed in Jasore, India, flying for the SOE in Burma. Um, so Stockwell was, was flying for Force 136, which was something I had never heard of, because um, most squadrons are, are such and such squadron, right, that you never see force. Um, so that, that piqued my interest and I did some Googling and it turned out that they were, um, conducting airdrops of agents and supplies into Japanese occupied Burma. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Trying to overthrow the, the Japanese. So with, with our, our interest in the, the commemoration of the dates surrounding yeah. right now, um, I thought that would be interesting to mention. He, um, I, I really nearly missed this, uh, this connection. Um, I was on what I thought was going to be the last document in the file. And I, I happened to notice that the, uh, as I said, they sent home a list of people who were, who were killed in the crash. Um, it, it mentioned that uh, the aircraft crash would, crashed with three British officers and three Burmese agents aboard. So, which made no sense to me. So that's, that's really what um, sparked my interest. And, and I ended up finding um, correspondence between the family and, and the uh, Air Force trying to find out more information and um, a quote which I thought was interesting is details are not yet available as these personnel were agents engaged on a secret mission and any message action as regards in from informing the next of kin etc will be dealt with by force 136 and is not an Air Force responsibility so that's something I've never seen yeah. um, and that, that level of um, Secrecy is just fascinating to me. So I, I, I spent like half a day just banging my head against the wall trying to find anything, which obviously was difficult. Um, and so it, it was their job was to supply allied ground forces behind enemy lines in the Southeast Asian theater. Um, and so it, it uh, as far as I can tell, based on like a forum post from, so it, it, I really was digging. Um, it's, uh, he, he was killed, uh, Stockwell was killed as part, uh, 
carrying out part of uh, Operation Nation, which was aimed at overthrowing the Japanese in Rangoon. So it was it was super. Do we know where they were based out of? I mean, they were they weren't flying for they'd be coming from a, a, a farther location, I would imagine. Do, do we have an airbase location or anything like that? Uh, yeah, it was it was uh, Jasor, India. So he, okay. as far as I can tell, they crashed on landing. Okay. Um, which is unfortunate, but uh, yeah, so they're flying from India into Japanese occupied territory. Quite the tracks. Yeah, it is, and uh, and and all the kind of connections I've made. Uh, uh, in, just my own knowledge of the, of the Second World War seems so much more familiar with the operations in Europe uh, than we mm -hmm. do with the operations in the Pacific. And you know, obviously, you know, you know Canadians flying out of India, uh, try, uh, you know, behind enemy lines and in, in for Japanese-controlled territories, uh, it's not something that's well known and well recognized, and uh, you know, yeah. quite a significant find to make those connections here locally um, to these these. Other operations beyond the European continent, uh, mm -hmm. re really, really driving home the fact that this is a world war. This is you know, yeah. the theater is right around the globe, and uh, and we'll talk again about the anniversaries and the that evolving or that sliding date of anniversaries for mm -hmm. the Second World War as well. So, um, on to our, our last, our, our fifth uh, uh, fact, if you will. Yeah. So um, this one, I'm I was a bit tentative about. Uh, adding but i felt it's it's necessary so aircraft man second class william bruce wilson um he is one of the individuals that was um, handed to me by my predecessors is kind of like a question mark um there's there's mention of him but we we don't know why he is on cenotaphs um so he's he's uh he was killed in the cabot strait in the sinking of the ss caribou um i should note he was he was born and raised in toronto his whole family lived in toronto um I can pull up the address, but um, so he is—he is at least somewhat local. Um, but so the the I thought it was important to message it, or mention it because the SS Caribou was um, a civilian ferry um, which was sunk in the Cabot Strait. So it was three times a week it made the crossing from Nova Scotia to Newfoundland um, when Newfoundland was, I believe, at the time an independent nation. It wasn't part of Canada yet, um, and it it uh, resulted in the death of 137 people, um, most of them civilian. Um, it was, uh, U-69 was a, a U-boat that had been patrolling Canadian waters. It had, it had a couple of days prior to that, um, sunk a vessel 250 kilometers upriver of Quebec in the Quebec city in the, uh, St. Lawrence. Um, so it was, it was stuck in the waters. And, um, so this, the, the sinking of the SS Caribou made news across the continent. Um, it, it's commonly cited as the, the most significant, which is a term that I, hesitate to use, um, but it's the most significant uh, sinking in Canadian waters during the Second World War. Um, in order to prevent the spreading of rumor and speculation, interestingly, the uh, government lifted military censorship of the matter immediately um, because it was, it was, it's, it occurred within eyesight, right? Canadians could see the sinking and, yeah. and see this happening. Um, and, and so it, 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 as I said, made news across the continent in the, in the, coming weeks and uh, it really became a rallying cry for the, the victory bond campaigns um, because it's the Germans are able to sink our people right. in our waters um, and it, it was it was really the moment that the the war in the Atlantic the U-boat war um, kind of struck home for Canadians because it's it's the the, the, the that specific U-boat which was uh, it had been in Canadian waters for quite some time, but it, it was more or less sinking small vessels and then it got this and that, that was kind of it. Um, it was a real turning point. It, it drives the, 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 the thought of war to your doorstep, um, to the Canadian mm -hmm. doorstep. Um, the, uh, so it was a civilian ferry. Um, uh, how many mm -hmm. casualties on the, on the, on the sinking? Uh, 137 were killed. Unbelievable. Um, and uh, this this individual himself, he he was a military soldier, but he was on the civilian ferry. Is that correct? Yeah. So he was. Um, let me pull him up. Bruce Wilson. I have so many files open right now. <laughs> um, where is he? He was. Yeah. He he was. Um, I believe a mechanic by trade. Yep. Um, and so he uh, he was he was. 
I, I must admit, I can't remember if he was in training still or, or what, but he was, he was making this, it was a routine trip. Um, the vessel was making it three times a week and it was escorted by a destroyer, yeah. um, which nearly rammed the U-boat, um, but it missed. And, and there was, there was real controversy surrounding it because, um, it spent, instead of immediately going to try and rescue survivors in the water, it spent two hours pursuing the U-boat, okay. which it, it had seen on the surface, um, which um, the, the Canadian military was careful to defend because right. that's, that was standard operating procedure because if it had stopped to pick up survivors, that would it would likely itself be sunk. Yeah, that um, would be the casualty next. Right. Um, um, in this this individual, I know we don't have kind of that direct uh, knowledge of connection to Mississauga, but mm -hmm. his name appears on our list. Uh, is his name on the cenotaph? Is that is that why? Or I believe so. Yeah. That's 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 an issue where coronavirus has kind of made that difficult for me because normally I would have just gone and <laughs> and driven to all the cenotaphs in the area, but that's kind of frowned upon right now. Um, we know for sure he was on the Ottawa Memorial because he has no known grave. Right. Um, it, his body was lost. Um, he had he had family in the Ottawa area, but he was he was from Toronto. So um, and and he had. Sorry, go ahead. And just just saying again is that this this moment, this this sinking a civilian ferry, regardless of uh, the nationalities or the, I guess the hometowns of those involved. Presumably, most of them are Canadians, but um, you know it drives home the point that you aren't safe at home uh this yeah. war this war is not just overseas uh for those engaged in supporting the war effort at home it drives ha it drives home the urgency it drives home the uh, the precarious nature uh of of uh of the world at war and uh um you know unlike the first world war which seemed to have that uh, that feeling that it's over there uh not here i mean the german u-boats made it abundantly clear that you were not safe uh, on your own shores um, and uh, this drives home the point and uh, would have had a, a, a far-reaching effect on the psyche of people um, uh, absolutely I mean horrendous and atrocious loss of life particularly from the civilian perspective um, but uh, yeah they, they just uh, it, it's baffling me to think about the, the u-boat in Canadian waters it's kind mm -hmm. of a and, I, and I've heard of those things before too. So it's uh, yeah. the loss of the caribou, very significant uh, in, in that story of, of uh, Canadian involvement in the, in the, in the yeah. Second World War. Um, so thank you for the fascinating facts. There are so many more. I know we've just, we're literally, I don't know, mm -hmm. the term of scratching the surface. I have a feeling we scratched the surface of scratching the surface. It's, uh, <laughs> Pretty much. It's, it's uh, been a, an interesting summer. And, and we'll, uh, interesting in many ways. I mean, you, you know, mm -hmm. we're all working from home and doing our best, but I, I commend you. Yeah. And, uh, doing your best in a, in a kind of a non-traditional research sense. Uh, we haven't been able to go to archives. We haven't been able mm -hmm. to physically see uh, old newspapers like the Street School Review and others. And, uh, you know, those are those are avenues to explore later on. That's, uh, again, I mentioned earlier that these projects never truly end. Uh, yeah, and and that's for a sure. good example of that. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, but again, the tremendous amount of work that you've done with this uh, with this research and, uh, and and compiling records and making sense of records, and uh, I thank you for that. And uh, thank you. Uh, it's been, uh, been been great to see, and I'm looking forward to delving into what you've collected uh, over time as well. Oh, yeah, I've left you a real mess. <laughs>2020 does mark the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to John to uh, kind of explain this, uh, these, these, these different dates uh, involved with the, the cessation of hostilities um, in the world's most deadliest uh, conflict that we have yet seen. So, uh, John, if you want to uh, delve into some dates with us a little bit. So, fun with dates. Um, as you said, there's there's... Uh, the First World War has Armistice Day, which is nice cut and dry. Um, whereas 
we have so BE Data is victory in Europe Day, which was May eighth, uh, I believe, um, with the German surrender on May seventh. But uh, victory in Japan, so which is it's victory over Japan Day, commonly known as VJ Day, um, often also known as VP Day for Victory Pacific Day, to make it nice and confusing. Um, in the, the British Commonwealth, it's typically celebrated on August 15th, um, which is the date that um, the Western Allied powers received uh, surrender terms from Japan. Um, and then in, in America um, and a few other nations, it's commonly celebrated on September 2nd, which was the date um, on which the uh, Japanese signed the uh, formal surrender terms aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Um, to further complicate things, the due to time zone differences, the Japanese and in, in, in Japan local in Japan's local time actually issued their surrender, their formal surrender in uh, on August 14th. So depending on where you live, there are really three dates which you can commemorate. Um, but the typical ones are August 15th and September 2nd. Um, so it's it's that's very much up in the air, um, and and I think is part of why it's it's less clear uh, the the celebration at the end of the Second World War is less clear. But um, really, to to consider the VJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day, you have to, to my mind, consider uh, Victory in Europe um, because you had when when the the fighting in Europe ended, um, which wasn't necessarily the the end of of. Uh, bloodshed. We had an individual, um, John Richard Busby, who um, was injured. He he had a he took a machine gunshot wound to his lower extremities um, on May second. He was uh, of 1945 admitted to hospital on the seventh, and then died of his wounds on May 9th of, of um, as far as I can tell, basically blood poisoning from gangrene. Um, so he was admitted the day before the Germans surrendered and died the day after uh, victory in Europe. Um, so it, it really wasn't the end. Um, but you had all of these forces in Europe that needed to now be moved over to uh, the Pacific Theater. And in my, my separate research, I'm doing the property research that I've been doing, I came across an individual who, he survived the Second World War, but he was, um, he was, he was fairly high ranking. He was stuck in England for Christmas of 1945. So several months later, because the Americans were still using all of any vessel available to get everything over to the Pacific. So it really was just a, a, almost like a global shutdown of any any effectively non-essential travel. Um, that said though, Canada had committed, um, according to Veterans of Paris Canada, um, by July of 1945, some 80,000 Canadians had volunteered to serve in the Pacific theater. And um, Canada had begun, uh, it, it, so they had begun concentrating on the West Coast for deployment, and uh, Canada had committed 60 vessels, military vessels, um, which would have been crewed by uh, almost 14,000 service members. So there was there was really a, a big commitment uh, with with the scale of Canada's population right. um, to to bring the fight to Japan. Um, and it, it uh, depending on how you look at it, it's a it's a hot topic, but um, the the Drop the use of the atomic bombs on August 6th and 9th really saved a lot of Canadians from going over to the, the Pacific. And, and so I certainly would have had more to work on um, in my, my research of Fallen, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, but it's it, definitely something. To, to look at those moments in time, too, I mean, you have the world's attention shifting, you know, uh, you know it was divided between Europe and, and the Pacific. And yeah, the, the the hostilities end in Europe, so the world's attention uh, shifts to the Pacific, um, and then you have this redeployment of resources. Uh, mm -hmm. In some cases, were pending, and then this you know the use of the of the of the atomic weapons at uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima uh, really force Japan's hand uh, in terms of its surrender, bringing what I you know what little I know of it myself in terms of bringing the war to an abrupt end. Um, in that uh, it was a it was a surrender from Japan, again announced uh, August fourteenth. We recognize here in Canada August fifteenth throughout the British Commonwealth, uh, and then the formal terms of surrender signed on uh, September second. So you've got these uh, kind of sliding dates, if you will. But uh, May eighth for VE Day, uh, August fifteenth in Canada for VJ Day. 
um, and in the United States, September 2nd, and uh, we, we, we certainly have this, this recognition of uh, uh, the, the ending of the Second World War um, and, and a world that could then, you know, in that vein of optimism, uh, um, rebuild itself. Of course, out of the Second World War arises the Cold War, uh, and so that's a whole different topic of, of discussion and, and the rebuilding from those moments in time continue right up to the modern day. And uh, um, But yeah, the Second World War, a moment in time that shook the world to its core. Um, and uh, Canadians and within that people from historic Mississauga involved within that larger conflict. So um, with that, John, Thank you for your tremendous research, for your eternal optimism of delving into, <laughs> the, into files. Uh, we look forward to more of what you found and uh, and uh, and sharing those stories with the residents of the city of Mississauga as we continue to develop the uh, the virtual war memorial um, and remembering those that served, remembering those that fell, uh, and sharing the stories of those who did not come home. So. Um, thank you, John. And, uh, thank you. It's been a privilege. Appreciate your bravery of jumping on the program with me. Happy to help. All right. Thanks.